Hi everybody, my name is Natalie Yeadon and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. For those of you who don't know what Impetus Digital is, is we're a company that has built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools for pharmaceutical, medical device, life science and healthcare companies to be able to do work with people like physicians, nurses, payers, patients and other allied healthcare providers. We've also unfortunately had a lot of people asking us to virtualize their meetings since the COVID-19 pandemic and have been helping companies with things like POA rollouts and sales rep training. At Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a thought. And we really want to actually engage people, not only at the, the level of brand or what's going on with pills, but some of these more juicier, more provocative, thought-provoking ideas, these big, hairy, audacious, bleeding edge things that are going on that we really feel when we start these conversations like we're doing in the fireside chat, that we can really start to move the needle on changing and modifying and positively disrupting healthcare. And so we feel within this premise, not only within the Insight platform, but within these fireside chats that we're just doing that. And being able to speak to people like Brenda McPhail on something that I think is very near and dear to everybody's heart and is part of the healthcare discourse that is going on currently and very rampantly today. So Brenda McPhail is the Privacy Surveillance and Technology Project Director at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. I'll start referring to that as the CCLA. And she's also a member of the National Security Team. Her work focuses on protecting privacy rights and creating public awareness about the ways privacy is at risk in our society today. And so there's gonna be a lot that we're gonna get into today as well. But prior to her current role, she worked as a researcher and a consultant with the CCLA and with the University of Toronto. So there she obtained a PhD um, from the Faculty of Information. She had studied and written in the areas of video surveillance, workplace surveillance and privacy, frontline experiences of identity and accountability in surveilled environments. She also did work in identity performance and construction in everyday settings and the ways in which technological changes are affecting the next generation in terms of our, ident our identification. So lots of stuff there and so pleased to have you, Brenda, here today at the table to start having this discussion with us. I'm delighted to be here. These are exactly the kind of conversations that I love to have where we talk about all, all things privacy, um, but related to something that's important for people um, like health information, for example. Absolutely. So maybe we can just take a step back and see that you have a, an advanced degree, a PhD in information, um, and had actually, did you know from the beginning this was a true interest from you, or did you just somehow find your way working with the CCLA? How did you get to where you are today? I stumbled to where I am today through a series of um, serendipitous events, essentially. Um, I have, I started out my academic career studying English literature. <laughs> I have two degrees in English. Um, and then what do you do with two degrees in English? You go to library school. Um, <laughs> now it's the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. And it was, uh, at the time, I was very focused on rare books. Um, there was a breadth requirement in my program and I took a course on information technology and it was like a world opened. It was fascinating. So I did another course with the same professor, Professor Andrew Clement, in participatory design and he sent us out into the field um, so to talk to people. We worked, we did a project where we worked with a nonprofit group that did advocacy for the families of uh, children who had been uh, victimized. Uh, and we had a project where they needed to make a database um, for use internally in their organization about the cases that they were dealing with and the circumstances of the families that they were trying to help. So obviously this information was really personal, really confidential. Um, the interest in keeping it private and secure was remarkably high. Um, and it was in thinking through the ways that 
information systems can protect data and organize it in ways that support work to help humans. Uh, that I got really excited about the idea of information and about privacy. Um, so I, from that course, I just kept going in that direction and learning more about social impacts of technology and went on to do my PhD with that professor who had inspired me so much um, in that course. So my, my movement from literature to human research and from books to computer systems was sort of a, a very gradual path. Um, but it was fun to all of a sudden realize that there was work and research to be done that was actually going to have an impact on living humans instead of studying the words of dead ones. <laughs> <laughs> so the CCLA has a lot of legs to it and there's so many different things. Maybe in a nutshell, you can describe to the audience what you do as the Privacy Surveillance and Technology Director. What is your mandate and what is sort of the core objectives of the organization? Sure. So as CCLA's uh, Director for Privacy Technology and Surveillance, I sort of have a tripartite role and it mirrors the, the three role, three mandates of the organization. So CCLA is an organization, a national, nonprofit, non-governmental uh, organization that's been active in Canada since 1964, so for a very long time, um, with the goal of protecting the rights and freedoms and civil liberties of people across Canada. So um, I began with them in 2015 as the privacy director. That was a new role at the time, and it emerged from an understanding on the part of the organization that issues of privacy were going to be one of the defining civil liberties issues of the 21st century. And we're going to talk a bunch, I think, about reasons why that is as we continue the conversation. Um, I serve, so CCLA is primarily a legal advocacy organization. And so like all of the directors, I serve as kind of a general counsel for litigation in, in our program areas. Uh, I work with amazing pro bono lawyers from across Canada who give their time to the CCLA to help us bring forward interventions at different levels of court. I think CCLA is the nonprofit organization that has intervened before the Supreme Court of Canada more than any other. Um, we also increasingly now uh, develop and bring forward our own applications. So the one that I was most recently involved in uh, was CCLA's litigation around the Smart City Project in Toronto. And that was over concerns that we didn't have the correct legal frameworks in place, the regulatory frameworks, uh, to make sure that data collected sort of from our infrastructure in cities was going to be adequately protected. Um, the other thing I do, we do a lot of advocacy in terms of law reform. So we do, I do things like serve as an expert witness for parliamentary or legislative committees or Senate committees. Um, either critiquing a, a bill or a, a proposed law or providing feedback for a, an, on an area that that committee is interested in. And um, then CCLA has a big public engagement, public education mandate. So we have an education wing um, that all the directors participate in where back in pre-pandemic days, we would be face to face with about 10,000 high school and elementary students a year. Um, currently we're doing that work online. And then talks like this, conversations with people in different industries, different sectors um, about privacy and surveillance and, and how rights come into play when we integrate technology into our daily lives. So let's linger on that a little bit, because as you know, our angle and the ecosystem that we serve is very life science focused, healthcare focused, you know, pharmaceutical, et cetera. So, I want to linger a little bit on the definition um, in, around technology intervention. So I want to understand, I mean, obviously there was a big piece there recently on the smart cities, and we probably could go back to that um, in a little bit. But tell me a little bit about what the mandate and the focus and any recent specifics that your team has worked on as it relates to health data. Can you share anything that is uh, specific on, on anything that you're working on in that regard? Um, sure. So health data is actually an interesting one uh, because it's not something that we have done a ton of work on. 
in the past. Uh, but in this time of pandemic, of course, um, that's changed rather dramatically because the current um, issues when it comes to technology and health are all about surveilling people in order to facilitate public health. And that, of course, involves collecting health data. So we've been very active in keeping track of the contact tracing debate in Canada and what it's, you know, how it's likely to work, um, looking at the different kinds of applications that are being rolled out worldwide in terms of the kind of information that's being collected, uh, the way that it's going to be used and secured, um, and the impacts that that is or isn't having on population health. Um, and we're watching very close, the other thing that we're watching very closely in terms of health information um, are concepts like immunity certificates. So the interaction between advances in medical science to do this kind of testing um, in a you know, real time or in a quick way, um, uh, the accuracy rates of those, and then the rights implications that would occur if these kinds of technologies were leveraged in a public health system and, and used to do things like limit someone's mobility based on, the, based on a test. So tell, let's um, let's dissect that one a little bit. So specifically on the issue around contact tracing, because this is obviously the big issue in Canada right now. Um, for those who are following this, there's apparently a Canadian built contact tracing application that has been developed by Shopify in conjunction with BlackBerry. Um, it has been put on hold because some provinces have approved it. There's others that are you know, stuck a little bit more in a quagmire of debate. What is specifically the debate about? What is the concern? And what are the issues that are on the table right now about the contact tracing app? Well, I mean, the first issue when you when you think about an application like this from a privacy perspective um, is whether or not um, it meets the thresholds of necessity and proportionality in order to roll it out. So to be clear, it is really unusual for a democratic government to want to roll out an application that essentially tracks the movements of individuals as they go through their daily lives. That's a really unusual ask. Um, that's not to say that there aren't reasons for the ask. I mean, we're in a pandemic. There's a health situation at the moment where you know many people would say that if there's a possibility that um, that kind of tracking uh, done carefully can genuinely support public health that that's worth doing um, so it's not i'm not saying that it's not maybe an interesting idea it is um, of course it is uh, but when you look at it from a privacy perspective it's really important to understand whether or not it sort of meets the threshold for use and one of the first under the necessity threshold, one of the first um, levels that we want to look at is does it work? Because if it's not effective, if it can't be shown to be demonstrably effective, then the invasiveness is possibly disproportionate, right? I mean, that, it's very simple. We, we don't get any benefit from it and we're asked to give up something um, for nothing. It's not a good idea. It's, that's not too complicated. So the first issue is whether or not it works. And that's a hard question to answer. Um, you'd think that it shouldn't be. <laughs> but the reality is, um, I heard a professor from MIT speak recently on this. And he said, if you'd come to me and said, you know, if you came to me tomorrow outside of this pandemic context and said, hey, I want to create an application that leverages the capacity of a Bluetooth beacon to detect proximity and create a database of contacts for public health tracing purposes. He would have said, he said, he would have said, hey, that's, that's a fascinating idea. There's gonna be some hurdles there. Give me 24 months and I'll get back to you. Um, we all know the situation is we found out sort of February-ish that this might be an issue and these apps started rolling out in March. Um, so this kind of technological innovation with untried technologies is, you know, it's complicated, it's difficult. And three or four months later, we're still learning 
about the ways that the, that the technology actually does and doesn't work. So to that end, the Alberta government in Canada was actually the first government in Canada to roll out their own app. Um, they did it before the federal government and the Ontario government working together created this, the one that you were mentioning with help from volunteers from Shopify and security audits from BlackBerry. So Alberta got the jump on the situation. They developed it um, with help from Deloitte based on the Singaporean app, the Trace Together app, which was, an, uh, which was on open source code. And the Alberta Information and Privacy Commissioner just last week released her report where they did looking at the privacy impact assessment for that application um, and the application itself and doing the analysis. And one of the key findings in that report is that the technology doesn't always work at the granular level that we're told it can. So these apps are being promoted with the idea that um, as we know, it's very important to be physically distanced from one another when we're out in public as a, as a safety measure. So the promise of this app is that it would detect people um, who also carrying the same app, if you were in a proximity of two meters or less for a period of time that was defined by the public health authority, it's often around 15 minutes, um, and it would store that contact in a privacy protective way on your phone uh, to be shared with public health in the event that you're tested positive and you want to let that person that you were in contact with know that they also have been exposed now and should possibly get tested. That's the theory behind the app. What the privacy commissioner found is that um, the app didn't just record contacts that were two meters away, it would record contacts from much farther distances as well. And it didn't just store the contacts that were from two meters away, that sorting process was actually done by Alberta Public Health in a manual process. So the amount of information that people were told in the terms of service of the app and in the government promotions uh, was different and less than the information that was actually being stored. Um, and that wasn't because the government wanted to deceive people about how the app worked. It was because the technology itself at the core of the app doesn't work at the granular level that we would ideally want it to work to do this kind of contact uh, proximity notification in a way that's really privacy protective. Very interesting. So, so, you know, obviously the conversation continues on the contact tracing app. And as we're sort of emerging through, many of us don't know if there's going to be a, you know, a sequel pandemic or not, but time is ticking and you know as the conversation and the debate continues it may sort of outlast it's like the warranty may expire um, but i suppose at least this is our first foray into these provocative discussions you know should something like this happen again we've at least started to pose the players at the table so that we can start again potentially with the right things in place so you know we can start the conversation again um canada you know what canada is doing it's i absolutely have to say canada has done a good job comparatively with other countries on this so um there are those who would say that we're slow off the mark uh but what our leadership has done is sort of looked at and learned from the mistakes that other places have made uh, the app, the national contact tracing app is actually just today moving into beta testing. I got a notification about that shortly before we went on air. Um, so they, they also, they weren't afraid on July 2nd, they weren't afraid to say, hey, we're, we're not quite there yet. We wanted to launch it right away. It was going to be ready to roll out in Ontario, but now that we've decided this is a national application, there are some more details that need to be worked out. We want to do some additional testing. Um, and we're going to take the time to get it right. We're going to take the time to, you know, think through more implications of this, including putting in some of the, the social wraparound protections that are so important. So we often, when we're talking about this application, as I just did for the last five minutes, talk about the technical aspects of it, how it's, how the, the specific technology is going to work. Um, what we don't talk about enough, but what's fundamentally important um, from a healthcare perspective, from the perspective of public health in particular, um, is how 
this technology is going to fit into what's really a very complex socio-technical system of public health, how it's and how the app is or isn't going to support people in being able to make responsible decisions about their health based on the information that the app helps them to acquire. So for the scenario that I always use is a, a grocery store clerk. I mean, we all know that um, often many of these people are making minimum wage. Their employment is precarious, particularly at a time of high levels of unemployment. They're faced with hundreds of people a day, potentially in a busy location. Um, so they're often going to be exposed. If the app really works, if all of the technical issues with the app get solved and it's perfect, and they get a notification every time somebody they've been in contact with tests positive, they could very likely have many, many, many notifications. So the social wraparounds that we need to make um, those notifications meaningful and not terrifying and stressful for those individuals are things like paid sick days to go get your test. Um, guarantees that if it turns out that you have to wait a few days for your test because in your province or territory the testing labs are backed up that you're not going to lose your job in the meantime and you can stay home for the safety of your your workmates and the people who are going to come into that business and not lose your job um, th that um, so those are like just a couple of considerations that, that needed to be thought through in conjunction with the app. And we're seeing that from our leadership in the recent announcement that the federal government is rolling out money for the provinces to support sick days, for example. Mm -hmm. So this that kind of wraparound has to go with the technology. And we didn't, one reason if an app would work in Canada where it hasn't worked and it hasn't actually been demonstrably shown to be very effective in any other country in the world so far, one reason it might work here is because they're looking at it in that holistic way. Very interesting. I want to kind of take a step further down this pathway um, outside of the COVID-19 sort of immediate pandemic and really just talking about healthcare and data privacy in general in this technological revolution that we're experiencing. Post COVID-19, we've literally reached an accelerant rate of change that wasn't expected. Telemedicine existed 10, 12 years way prior to this. And we've just seen this accelerated rate of usage changing in billing codes and abilities for physicians to do this. We've seen an, an astronomical acceleration of Health Canada changes in their protocols on how they're now accepting things like software as a medical device to be incorporated the utilization of apps that people are wearing to be able to integrate into clinical studies and to be able to leverage those for tracking of health information. And perhaps also this conversation about electronic health records, patient portals, and the whole interoperability. At the end of the day, I guess what I'm really asking here, Brenda, is there's an ecosystem and a complex interconnectedness of technology with the fuel being health data. And so this is accelerated and I'm sure is now rapidly on your radar screen, if not being actively discussed. Tell us a little bit about what the CCLA is thinking and doing with the very um, you know, uh, thorough way that you do social wraparounds and discussions and discourse and legislation I'd love to kind of get your opinion on what is happening in that space. Um, so a really important um, factor in that space uh, is our privacy law. Um, I think that it's widely acknowledged across Canada uh, that our privacy laws are getting old and creaky. Uh, they were made in times when these the kinds of technologies that you were describing um, were a twinkle in an inventor's eye, where the kinds of uses for data were at best only starting to emerge, um, where artificial intelligence and machine learning applications were nowhere near where we are now. Um, so, in a, so in other words, the laws were made at a time when the, the ways that technologies can function uh, the uses for which information can uh, serve 
and the risks and the benefits that that creates were really unimaginable to the legislators. Um, so it's really past time that both the public and the private sector privacy laws in Canada get updated. Uh, and that's particularly important when it comes to health information. Um, the jurisdiction around privacy laws in he and health is complicated because there are provincial laws, there are federal laws, jurisdiction for health is typically provincial, um, but jurisdiction for the private sector uh, can be federal if it's in a, if there's a situation where the province doesn't have its own law. So first of all, it's a, it's a complicated legal landscape. Um, but within that landscape, um, we've still got a, a set of laws uh, that don't cover all the possible ways that uh, data could be, that data use could go wrong for people. I mean, what we're looking for when we're looking for a good privacy law is a law that puts up um, the safeguards to assure people that they can trust that when they participate in something new or exciting or innovative um, using a technology that's new to them, uh, that, that essentially the, the state, the government has their back, that the laws are in place to make sure that companies have a legal framework in which they operate that is appropriately privacy protective. That's not to say so privacy protective that innovation is impossible. That's always one of the bugbears of privacy is they say, ah, oh, privacy is a barrier to innovation. Um, that's nonsense, I would say, um, because people are really becoming increasingly aware. I mean, not to dwell on it again, but the whole question about uptake for contact tracing apps has been focused on the fact that people are scared that they're going to be too privacy invasive to use, and so they're not using them. Um, we don't want that with health technology. We want a system where people are comfortable using those tools that may provide genuine benefit to themselves and to us as a society, because they know that the law provides the appropriate backstop to make sure that their information is only gonna be used in ways that they expect, that they understand, that they consider reasonable, um, and that are not going to be harmful to them. So one of the main ways that CCLA engages is, is in law reform. And it's something that I'm spending a great deal of time thinking about BC is currently going through a review of their privacy law. Quebec just introduced a revolutionary new privacy statute. Um, and both the federal, the federal government has been talking about um, both the Privacy Act, which is their public sector privacy act, and PIPEDA, which is their private sector privacy act needing reform for a long time. And if we hadn't been stuck with this pandemic, probably by now we would be in the middle of committee hearings around revising at least the the private sector act. So you mentioned something that's extremely pivotal as part of this conversation, and that, that is about innovation. So again, COVID-19, good or bad, you know, it, there's obviously two sides to the reality of, of what has happened. But one of the silver linings is this accelerant for innovation. But at the same time, you're butting heads with a core area in healthcare around um, impingement because of privacy. I was wondering, so one of the things I think is a really important equation, just let's say, for example, I'm a pharmaceutical company. And, you know, one of the things around innovation is not only around technological innovation, how do we continue to provide adequate and, and excellent healthcare digitally, you know, over Wi-Fi or what have you, and how do we do that effectively, efficiently, and cost effectively with some of these new innovations? But in addition, discovery, so new drug, chemical, or other sorts of, uh, of, of sort of interventions um, using data lakes and data information. I think really the, the, you know, so I wanna tap into this. I'm a researcher. I wanna help with discovery and innovation in, in any of these ways. How do we go about doing this in a, in a safe and tangible way without feeling all the times that information has to be cloistered and it's not accessible? We see this a lot happening at a provincial level. I'm just using theoretically, for example, cancer data. Every province has their own way of managing it and mandating it and protecting it. And there isn't this data lake available for researchers Canadian-wide or even globally-wide 
for truly innovating and pushing health forward from a population health management standpoint. What's your thoughts around PEPIDA or maybe some sort of a Canadian version of a GDPR or some sort of a discourse on how to free the data while protecting it? I mean, it, it's a whole, whole can of worms, I think. It's a whole can of worms. Uh, the can is really full and the worms are really wriggly and slimy. <laughs> so it's a, you know, it's a, an apt and sticky metaphor. Um, there, are, there are a few threads that need to be, or I guess go back to the worms. We can pick some worms out of the can and take a look at them more closely. Um, one, of it, one of them is around um, user expectations or participant expectations and participant consent. So there's a, a real question as to whether with private sector technology, healthcare or otherwise, um, meaningful and informed consent is doing the job that it was meant to do. And part of the reason for that debate is kind of what you described, which is that there are now um, both commercial and public interest imperatives for maybe using data that was collected for one purpose for something else. Um, but at the same time, we have a conception of privacy that's largely centered on individual uh, consent and control. We believe in informational self-determination. We believe that people have the right, and this dates way back to 1967 and Alan Weston and his thinking has informed a lot of the, of the legislation and the jurisprudence in this area. Um, it's the concept that people have the right to know who's going to collect their information and what they're going to do with it um, and what effect their, that use is going to have on them. So when you're in a research context, that's a hard thing to fulfill, right? It's hard to tell people our research is absolutely going to do X or Y. That's the, because when you start a project, if you're doing it right, you don't necessarily know. You hope you have hypotheses, but you're not sure. Um, so the question of how to get people to buy into that is difficult. Um, but I don't think that the way that we do it is by taking control away from people. It's by educating people on uh, the need to participate, uh, not just because it's good for them, but because it's good for us as a society. And I think that what we've seen it's almost impossible to have these conversations without going back to the pandemic. It's the nature of the times. I mean, what we've seen in this time of pandemic is people are amazingly willing to cooperate with things that they might not have been willing to do if they're made to understand that it's for their own good or for the good of their loved ones. Right? Um, so I think when it comes to using medical data, um, we need to have some really open conversations about what those uses look like, um, who gets, how that collection happens, and what a consent process looks like and how we can modernize the idea of consent to make sure that users uh, continue to feel informed and engaged in what's happening with their information and the way that their information is contributing to the public good um, by when they participate in these kinds of projects. So I don't think the solution is to take control away from individuals, it's to bring them along with the project. Um, and some of that can happen through education. Some of that can happen through law reform, opening up the spaces for those kinds of consents to be obtained. And some of it can happen technologically with new and interesting ways through mobile devices, for example, um, to renew consent, to um, inform people about changed purposes and to make sure that as, a, again, to, to bring people along with the technology, using the technology. I think there's huge potential for that. Yeah, so this is really intriguing. And, you know, again, I'm coming from a completely, you know, non-biased place. Our company just services a lot of, you know, companies and entities and, and healthcare, provi you know, providers, etc. We just kind of hear from, you know, the back end that there always seems to be some issue around advancement and running into issues around being able to do that based on issues around privacy and not being able to access data, access to these data lakes and making information free. Um, so that just seems to be a general um, consensus 
with certain, uh, certain groups um, or entities. But I just want to kind of linger a little bit more on, on the conversation and the level of education for everybody to get around the table so that legislation can be updated and upgraded and modernized. One of the things that I have to say is just as a citizen is I only recently came across um, the, the knowledge that there is a Canadian digital charter that exists. And I'm actually a relatively educated Canadian citizen. And I just found that out by digging and being part of, you know, this discourse. Uh, I don't really believe that, you know, generally speaking, Canadians know that there's a digital charter or what's in the charter or what does privacy mean and what does security mean? And I think more importantly, we only get what we hear in the press where we hear that, you know, a certain company X had open source code and they were drinking such and such beverage and, you know, now they know everything about their drinking habits. So there's only kind of the negative, there's the mass media, and then there's this lack of general education on what really is going on there. And I think to layer on top of that, Brenda, I think that there's a lack of understanding in this new world that we live in of what's, what is data ownership versus what is data sharing. And should we really be reinvestigating what the meaning of privacy is in a new world that we live in that's you know, technology ridden? I mean, maybe the whole definition of that needs to be changed. So I think really in summary for my question is, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of players at the table. And I don't necessarily think that everybody is coming to the table fully educated on what the issues are. Can you speak a little bit about you know, what you're seeing and how you think we can change that so that we can bring people together and make these changes and make these legislation uh, modernizations uh, happen more rapidly? Sure. Um, so I, ha I have to say that my, my impression of the level of knowledge that people have, if you'd asked me this two years ago compared to now, I would have been much less sanguine that people were starting to get it. I think that um, people are. But the way that they're getting it uh, is that you can't pick up a newspaper or pick up a tablet and read it online. I realize I'm dating myself talking about the papers um, without finding a privacy story, right? I mean, we could, I could tick off on all my fingers and all my toes, the ones that I've seen just in the last week or so um, from Tim Hortons doing location tracking to unexpected location tracking to smart devices that are voice activated, um, actually having humans listening into conversations to the guy who used a fitness tracker on his Android phone and ended up getting hauled into a police station on suspicion of burglary um, and only figuring out that it was because he'd been on his bike at a particular time in a particular neighborhood uh, because he had the money to get a lawyer who was able to figure out um, what information the police were going on. So those are the kinds of stories that people are hearing all the time. And there's stories about ways in which technology puts us at risk. There's stories about the ways that private sector companies in particular are using our information in ways that benefit them or profit, create profit for them, but that people haven't really fully understood are part of the business model when they use that product. Um, and that's, I mean, Shoshana Zuboff calls that surveillance capitalism. We're operating in a technology environment where technologies have actually deliberately been designed to collect information outside of the service that they provide us or that we think that we're contracting for um, in order to create data streams that provide a, sec you know, a secondary line of profit. So people who create Internet of Things devices, I've heard them say very openly, we don't make our money from selling our product. We make our money from the data streams produced by the product. Um, so that's, so first of all, people's understanding and fears about the privacy of their personal information are coming from 
a beginning understanding of that economic model um, and the stories that are coming out in the press of the ways that that economic model that they don't fully understand can come back to bite them. So that's, I mean, and the way that those, that model, those models have been created and allowed to thrive um, are, is essentially in a regulatory vacuum, right? Um, the technology is ahead of the law. Um, the tech, people who create the technologies know far more about it, obviously, as it, than the people who are using it. And in some cases, more again <laughs> than the people who are supposed, who are tasked with regulating it or creating the laws that will regulate it. So, so you're right that there's this sort of information vacuum and that people are getting the information they have um, from the stories where it shows what the problems are. Um, and there's not a lot of counter narrative about this, you know, stories about where it's really worked. Um, a pessimist might say that's because there aren't so many of those stories. Um, and I think that there's, there is something to that concern. Um, when you use a fitness app, do you expect your personal information to be collected in such granular detail um, and shared with police? Is it a reasonable expectation that that would happen? Um, when you think about it, um, anytime there's big pools of information, in some ways it's reasonable to expect law enforcement in pursuit of justice and in solving crimes to be looking for those pools of information and seeking access to them. As those pools get bigger, um, as we allow them to be created about ourselves by our voluntary use of these products, is it reasonable to expect that they're going to be accessed? Uh, maybe moving forward, some people might say that it is. Um, once everyone is fully informed about the way the technology works and how the data is kept and stored um, and how the laws about accessing it work. Um, but for the average person who just says, oh, I'm going to go for a run and before I do, I want to know how far I went, click, download the app, um, they're going to say, no, that's not a reasonable expectation. I'm picking up a tool that I'm told is going to do this. It's going to count my steps. Nobody told me it was going to do all of these other things. Um, so I think that the, the ways technology works and people's understanding of the way that they work has to evolve um, for the kinds of conversations that we then need to be able to have about, well, how can we make sure that the way these technologies work um, is for human benefit, which in fairness could include in reasonable situations um, and with judicial authorization used by law enforcement, um, but might not. And how do, we, how do we have those conversations about how much information it's reasonable for this app to collect? How do we have the conversation that says what's reasonable, what are reasonable ways for companies to profit from secondary uses of information? Um, and what are reasonable ways for companies to have to make sure that people understand what those uses are? And this, if we wanna pull back to the medical data, as I'm sure we do, <laughs> um, is really important. So one of the things we're seeing in the, in the health data field is things like wearables, like Fitbits, like smartwatches, uh, like you know, fitness tracking apps that are collecting really detailed medical inf information about um, our heartbeats and our activity levels. And what's one of the, and it's, and they're being marketed as the more you know about your health, the more prepared you can be to um, stay fit, to stay healthy and to protect yourself. That's the framing for these products to people. Um, but companies have a little bit of a different framing sometimes and third parties have a, fra a, a separate framing altogether that we can't necessarily predict. So what's one of the first um, legal uses for data from fitness apps? It's to look at cases of insurance fraud. It's insurers who are going to companies that um, have this string of data from these apps that we wear on our wrist or on our shoe and trying to figure out whether or not when we said that we were crippled up after our car accident and couldn't move around for three weeks, whether we were really not moving. Um, so those are the kinds of um, 
Secondary and unexpected information uses that scare people and that when they become aware of them, they start to question their participation in this sort of everyday world of technology that on, in other ways, we're increasingly being encouraged to participate. So I think you bring up something incredibly important, and that is really around, at the end of the day, this is really about risk mitigation. And I think that part of the issue here, Brenda, around fully encompassing education, meaning not only is it the downsides, and the repercussions and the impacts on you know, insurance companies and what it means and some of the basically I call it fear mongering or you know, there's that sense of reality because that certainly is part of it. But equally, if there isn't as many good, good news stories, what could a good news story look like? And I think that when I, one of the things I'm seeing is a bit of a void in that balance, a balance of the discussion and so I think just anytime you put something new on the table, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that we're leaning too heavily on the, the risks and the, these are the terrible things, these are the bad things. And so how can an average citizen get the full perspective on what options are if we don't also have the anticipated good news story? Um, and so I just, I, I guess I'm just kind of curious as to, um, what that could look like. I realize in this question, there's also a lot of other things that are happening from a societal standpoint that adds to the fear. And we realize that there's many governments out there that are uh, have new legislations that are very social crediting, and there's utilization of data in ways that are very scary. And, um, you know, you know, we realize that there's apps out there as well, too, that people are just, you know, uh, voiding and, you know, uh, and, and putting moratoriums on them and, and all those sorts of things. So all we ever hear is those things. And we're not hearing about the new data that's actually being developed or being extracted for a new COVID-19 vaccine or, you know, the new discovery to basically overcome cancer or something like that. So I was wondering if you could speak to what, you know, why you think there's a, um, an inequality or, a, in, you know, an imbalance between the good and the bad. Um, well, I think in some ways it is the hype about the potential of technology that leads us to jump on those instances when it turns out that that hype is false. So, um, part of, I think, part of, I think the problem in our, in our fixation, our, our societal fixation on when things go wrong on the bad news stories is the fact that, um, in the framing of the technology, usually what we hear is it's going to be really good. It's going to benefit you. It's going to free you up. It's going to open up your time. It's going to give you more. It's going to give you better. Um, when it comes to whatever the functionality of the of the tool is, um, and be, and it's because we hear about these technologies from a marketing perspective, um, the way that we are encouraged to engage with new technologies and let's face it, purchase new technologies um, is by telling us how awesome they're going to be, how amazing they're going to be, how they're going to make our lives better, and the parts about um, risk for individuals that would help us decide whether or not we want to welcome this tool into our life are buried in 20 pages of legalese fine print um, under a link that you have to know where it is and find it and click on it and then pour through the document to figure out how it's actually going to work. Uh, and the way our law works is that as long as somewhere in those 20 pages of legalese fine print, it tells you hey, we're going to do, um, in addition to the service we're providing, we may use your data for, and it's always weaselly words like research purposes, or to improve our product, um, or possibly um, sometimes uh, to share with select third party partners, um, unless you sort of plow through the terms to get there, um, you're not made aware of those things up front. And that's that sort of the combination of the marketing hype and the obfuscation 
that with anything that's new and that involves information, there are always marginal risks. And there may always be ways that um, information collected by that tool could be used in ways that you might not expect. When that's not foregrounded at all, I think people are starting to feel betrayed. And that's caused the tech clash. That's caused the backlash against the idea that um, these technologies might actually truly be a force for good in our lives. Um, it's, it's precisely because we're not talking about them realistically in the first place. It's precisely because they're being pushed as new and exciting and amazing and sure to be the latest, greatest, best thing you've ever done. Um, that when it turns out that maybe they're not, uh, people aren't just turned off or annoyed, they're actually feeling um, betrayed, right? So I think part of how we need to figure out how to encourage people to embrace new ideas about technology is to be more honest and transparent and accountable about the ways the technology is going to work about how we think it's genuinely going to help people, and this is particularly relevant in the health context, how we think it's genuinely going to help. Um, and if there are any risks, um, to be honest about them. And healthcare professionals are good at this, right? Because in a traditional medical study, there's a huge process around making sure that people understand both what they will get from participating in any given project or study um, and what the risks to them are. And I think that in general, the technology world could learn from that approach um, because people are, in the end, people are smart. People are interested, I think. I think we've really shown in Canada that people are interested in contributing to the common good um, if they can be made to understand that it is genuinely about the common good. Um, but for them to have that faith that what they're participating in is truly going to be something that's beneficial and not harmful. Um, they have to know how it's working and really importantly, what the motives are. So a lot of the, a lot of the issues that come in, I think with some of these products reasonably because we live in a capitalist society is that um, some of the motive, particularly behind private public sector information sharing relating to health and healthcare applications, um, contains an element of necessary profit to keep the thing going. Um, but when profit motives come into play, there's reasonable distrust on the part of people uh, that that motive isn't going to be stronger than the so motive. So it's going to be really interesting in the future about potentially demonetizing some of this by potentially using um, things like blockchain and attaching people's data in, in sort of a, an encrypted manner where people will be completely in control of who's using, seeing, and potentially even self-monetizing their own data. Um, I'd be very curious to see how smart cities might include that in future infrastructure. Um, there's so much in that. I mean, that's a whole other dialogue and discussion about smart cities and smart hospitals and smart homes and smart cars and everything interconnected and talking to each other. So I guess really just in summary, Brenda, I mean, what is your hope for the next five to 10 years in Canada? Um, what, is, what is it going to look like? And what is your aspiration for the average Canadian citizen? Hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, I would be careful about the idea of people monetizing personal data whether through blockchain or any other interesting innovation. Uh, because one of the real concerns in the privacy community is that privacy will be something that you can only afford to choose for yourself um, if you're affluent, if you're rich, if you've got, uh, if your position in life is such that you don't need to sell your information and that it can genuinely be a choice for you mm -hmm. to sell your information. Um, so um, as with all kinds of technology where there's an exchange. There's often one party that's got the power and one party that has um, far less. And when it comes to information about people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, 
people who are racialized, people who are vulnerable, people who suffer from disabilities or health conditions that render them potentially more valuable for some mar markets, um, but at the same time more vulnerable. Um, I think we have to be very careful about looking to monetization of data as a, as a privacy or as a, as a solution that will lead to, you know, a, a safe, equitable society, because I have very serious concerns about the ways that that could play out against those values of, um, you know, quality and equality and privacy. So that's, that would be the first thing to worry about that. I think that we need to start thinking as a society about where our values lie and what the legislative means to protect them are. It's something that is hard. It's a fraught process because even in a country where the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada actually ranked in a survey a year or so ago over top hockey as something that Canadians were most proud of in our country. So even in a culture where we have a really strong connection to the idea of a, a shared set of rights and values that form the foundation for our society, we're still going to disagree about the way that those values need to be put in or need to be protected and safeguarded when it comes to legislation, um, when it comes to um, trade-offs between absolutely open potential for exploring and more, you know, and ways to narrow the scope of exploration to make sure that it's as open as possible while still according with a set of a set of core values. Those conversations are going to be really hard. Um, and the way that we need to have them is by uh, being really open about it, by bringing all the parties to the table, by making sure that no one group is able to speak louder and longer than others <laughs> in terms of influencing the process. So I think I think that the way that our privacy law ends up being reformed in the next um, in the short term in the next year to three year time frame, which is when I think many of them will be be done, is going to determine what kind of society we live in for the next 50 years. I was listening to a talk by Shoshana Zuboff the other day, and she basically said, if we don't solve the underlying problems of surveillance capitalism and the idea that um, data is about, is purely about economic benefit uh, to the detriment of social good and, de and democracy itself, um, democracy itself is going to falter as we move forward. And I think that that kind of thinking needs to inform the ways that we approach uh, innovation, the ways that we approach data and data governance, the ways that we approach privacy, the ways that we allow or don't allow new forms of surveillance in our society, understanding that surveillance is not necessarily a negative thing, it can also be a positive thing, because surveillance is sustained attention to an individual's behavior for purposes of management, influence, or protection. Um, so there are, you know, there are legitimate and important uses of surveillance in our society, particularly when it comes to public health, as well as dangerous and problematic uses from a rights perspective. So I think those, all those sort of complex nuanced questions about what we care about, what we want our world to look like, and then how we can develop laws that will take us there um, need to happen really soon and we shall see what comes of it. <laughs> I, you know, Brenda, I mean, it's so well put and it's such a complicated topic. Honestly, I could speak to you for days on this. There is so much and what a job that you have. Um, I, I think that uh, there's, there's a lot there and I, I personally love uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book, uh, you know, Surveillance Capitalism is brilliant. And there's, uh, you know, so many great nuggets there. But you also bring up some important things and there's legislation. We see it happening with our friends down south already happening now, um, you know, in a typical unfortunate Cold War that we're seeing with other countries. And so this is already starting. The conversation is happening. The decisions are being made. 
um, and Canada, you know, may end up getting stuck or brought in through the the onslaught or the groundswell of, uh, of of energy and momentum there. So we shall see. But you do bring up an important point. I think I'm just going to summarize by saying the conversation um, it started. It needs to continue and it needs to be sustained. And I agree that it's going to have huge implications for the life in the world that we're going to have in the future, either here or in Mars, according to Elon Musk. Um, but, uh, you know, and here's the reason. I mean, Impetus really believes that, again, these conversations are essential. These fireside chats, speaking with people like you, the provocateurs, the people who are really getting us to think and getting us to think, what does this world look like in this, in this space? Not only smart cities, but health and surveillance and facial recognition and, you know, all these other things that are going on and surveillance, uh, government information sharing. And that, like I said, there's tons here. But really, I just want to say for those people listening, this is again the reason why Impetus has the Insight platform. We want to be the purveyors, the bridge, the, the platform to start these conversations, working with pharmaceutical companies, other, other interested um, healthcare stake stakeholders to have these conversations about privacy and security. What does legislation look like? How do we educate people? What is, what is the discourse going to look like? And so that's going to happen and we invite you to, uh, to work with Impetus on that. We will have this recording uh, available to everybody who is interested or to share with others who maybe uh, want to also listen to this discussion. Um, please follow us at our website. The, we will provide the links to our Twitter, our Facebook, our, um, our YouTube channel, as well as our LinkedIn. And we will also provide the LinkedIn profile for Brenda um, and the CCLA as well too, if you're interested in connecting with her. Thank you very much, Brenda, for an absolutely exceptional conversation and some brilliant ideas. Uh, thanking everybody for attending today or listening to this afterwards. Wishing you all a very uh, excellent rest of your day.